want to take this opportunity to thank uh, uh, Dr. Jorend uh, Hummel, who is actually live from uh, the Netherlands. Uh, he is the uh, he is a PhD who specializes in many things in cardiac, and uh, he's also the uh, co-founder uh, of uh, this uh, wonderful company called US2.ai, which I recently came across. Uh, this particular product is available in Canada as well as US has been uh, approved and it's a fascinating um, product. And when I saw this about uh, two weeks ago uh, with the representative in, uh, uh, in North America, and I was completely blown away. So I thought, you know, we'll just have to get uh, uh, this group to come and tell us about our future, whether we're gonna still have a job afterwards. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass on uh, this particular uh, presentation to Dr. Hummel. Yeah, thanks. You're you're immediately setting the setting the bar quite high, right? So, um, uh, thanks for having me. My name is is Joran Hummel, and uh, like introduced, I'm in in the Netherlands, and I have a long clinical background in echocardiography itself. So, um, I used to be affiliated to the University Medical Center in Groningen, where I uh, where I actually started off as a sonographer. Uh, so I did my fair share of echoes, uh, approximately 25,000 of them. Um, I did a PhD on strain imaging and um, um, uh, and the detection of subtle cardiac damage. Um, and I founded an imaging core lab. So I've been through the works of of, of echocardiography in in uh, in the broadest sense in that uh, in that way. Um, and in the end, I got out of echocardiography. Um, for a good reason, I I got fed up with with um, with searching for for the best image, with searching for a certain frame. So one frame in all the the two hundred frames I had acquired, I was fed up with searching for a label to do a measurement, um, and 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 putting points on 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 images. And not that I did not like echo anymore, because I still love echo. I'm fully into hemodynamics and cardiomechanics. Uh, but I, I I wanted to focus on on specifically those two things and not on all the manual labor intensive um, uh, work in echo. Um, let me see. So, um, in addition to that, it's it's um, basically we got a problem in echocardiography. I saw this in my country um, um, already, but but we have sonographer shortages just to get a lay of the field for us. So when I started working in, in uh, 23 years ago in my hospital, basically throughout those 23 years, we always had an opening, a job opening for a sonographer. We were continuously training, but we still had um, 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 huge openings. Uh, and a small search on, uh, on Indeed in the US shows us that we have over 4,000 vacancies there. Uh, in Canada, I looked like two days ago, it was 121 job openings for cardiac sonographers. Um, in, the, in, in the Netherlands, still 28. So Netherlands is a, a really small country in that sense. Um, but, but what immediately caught my eye was that in the US, they even offer sign-on bonuses and, 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 and moving uh, bonuses, which, you know, my mind started boggling already. Um, but, you know, that's what the market is at this point. Um, and those those uh, those shortages actually they also lead to a backlog of of echoes. Um, I saw this in or we see this in the in the UK, um, which is one of the uh, problem areas at this point where where people are waiting for over six weeks. Um, there's there's uh, certain regions where people are waiting over a year, and you know there's even health deprived or healthcare deprived regions where they don't have access to a super cool diagnostic tool as echocardiography at all right um and the last thing and this is this is also one thing i endured uh, in my uh, in my long career in echo is is the the musculoskeletal injuries that that sitting that you know every sonographer or everyone in echo gets because of the the crooked uh sitting to acquire the images of of, of pushing on the probes uh, so, so a lot of these uh, sonographers, they actually experience work-related pain, um, and up to 20% of them suffer career-ending injuries. So, all in all, um, we have a great field in echocardiography, but we have problems. 
And the question is, what can we do about that? So to understand what we can do with that, we first need to understand what a sonographer does. Um, again, I don't have to tell, tell all, the, all of you what a sonographer does, um, but the basis is, is basically we do an image acquisition and we do the recognition of, of that image. So the plex has a plex and an apical four is an apical four. We do structure recognition. So we recognize when we see those two leaflets of the mitral valve between the LV and the LA, we actually recognize that it's an anterior and a posterior leaflet. Uh, we do annotation, so we delineate the endocardium of an LV, and we interpretate those numbers. Um, to do it in a more illustrative way, we gather all kinds of images, um, and then we sort them, and then we arrange them, and then we visually present them, and from that we get to a, um, a, a very logical explanation of what we have seen, um, and that tells the story of an echo. And for machine learning purposes, um, that kind of works the same. So if we want to teach a machine to do the same as uh, the same steps as we as humans do with an echo, sometimes unconscious, because if I look at an echo exam, I, I don't say out loud, this is a flax, right? This all happens in my, in my brain. And, and so all those steps that we need to get out of that black box of the human brain, sort it, make it um, um, available for machine learning purposes. Um, so um, um, that has to be done and can be done um, because, you know, what, uh, let me get this one out of the way. Yeah, so I asked ChatGPT, uh, what are the current, uh, current issues in echocardiography? Uh, I described them, but of course I want I want the AI or an AI in this case to uh, uh, to agree with me. And and luckily, ChatGPT came up with the same um, uh, descriptions of issues in echocardiography. So one is the image quality. Um, uh, echocardiography echocardiography obviously relies on the quality of the acquired images. So if echo can do something or AI can do something to help humans always acquire the best. Um, um, the best quality of images that would be would be good. But there's operator dependency uh, within humans, and I will get back to that because I have a couple of great examples for that. Um, there's limited accessibility. This is one of the things we discussed already. The cost and equipment limitations um, is also one of them. So you can't go into um, uh, rural Tanzania with this huge EA95 and roll it through the through the bush that's that's not happening right so we need better handheld scanners etc uh, data management and integration so we need those echoes to be better integrated in the whole scheme of, um, of of patient data so we can actually do more disease prediction for example uh, and standardization and guidelines is is another one where AI can uh, can prove its work Of course, uh, when we look at echoes, um, it's not always that easy, right? We know about all the textbook images where all the structures are really crispy and, and uh, yeah, we recognize all the structures and all the structures are really well visualized, but that's not always the case in echocardiography. So technical quality of images, um, um, you know, is, is one of the fields where we can uh, get in. So, what are these limitations? And I will go through this very, uh, very fast. Um, but optimization of, for example, um, um, not foreshortened images. As soon as we start to foreshorten the left ventricle, the length of that ventricle is a little bit less. And that has an influence on our volumetric measurements, our EF, and, and all those things. And those have been well described. Um, even more so, we can do this in plaques, and even the angulation of your measurement, for example, um, has, has a huge influence on, um, uh, on the outcome of your measurement. Um, and, and in this case, uh, uh, where, where Forcelinos et al. Have, um, had done an interventor comparison and an interreader comparison, they ended up with, with, a, um, with a mean error of 70% for, uh, for, for the posterior wall only. And you know, I think 
that everyone in echocardiography knows that you know we do things a little bit differently even though we do standardization as much as possible with standardization only that's you know we still end up with uh, uh with variability uh even worse if we if we step away from doing measurements um, um uh, or at least do a full annotation of an lv for example we end up with with a 10 percent absolute percentage points difference in ef uh, so so that's that that's huge right and and that's why i always say well echocardiography isn't so much a exact science you still need to use your head and and even though we do automation it doesn't exempt you as a uh, as an echo specialist to keep thinking about what do i see and do the numbers add up um what i found very interesting is is something we do the, or, or which i did a lot in my career was the regional wall motion um, um, abnormality scoring so uh, where we actually said well we have a normal kinetic uh, segment we have a hypokinetic segment and an akinetic segment and basically when this israeli group started started um, um, researching that and, and and seeing if we as humans could even agree on it uh, it turns out that we we tend to agree on what is normal um, but as soon as we start talking about hypokinetic we have no idea anymore uh, what is hypokinetic when is it akinetic so there's always a little bit of variability in what a human thinks about that. So the question then becomes, uh, can AI uh, mimic what a human does? And so I asked the question to ChatGPT, uh, what role does AI play in echocardiography? Well, for one, it's the image quality and quality enhancement, um, but also image recognition, uh, image segmentation, so the simple doing of measurements, disease detection, risk stratification and prognosis, workflow optimization so how can we make the sonographer more efficient uh, and education and, and training so reading this coming from chat gpt i thought wow that sounds kind of kind of promising um but of course you always need to be you know kind of skeptical of of of, of the of over promising in ai so what what, what i really wanted to um, uh, look into is how well were all those things actually validated? So if we start talking about um, um, AI, um, there's always a lot of terminology to throw in. Uh, one of them is, is, is AI, artificial intelligence, and we have machine learning and deep learning. And, and why I think this, uh, this image is, is, is really important because it, it, it takes those terms uh, and defines them a little bit. So artificial intelligence is basically everything, the development of smart systems and, and machines that can carry out tasks that typically require human intelligence. Machine learning is a part of artificial intelligence and deep learning is a part of, of, of that one again, right? So there's different structures. So artificial intelligence. When I first got, got confronted with artificial intelligence, I, I kind of felt this overwhelming thing of oh my what is what is it it's going to take my job um, um right so so the question is is ai really something new um and if we look at artificial intelligence it basically is nothing new i have a computer when i open it up it recognizes my face and it says hey Joran, uh here's here's all your files um just yesterday my wife dictated a a grocery uh, list for me and that got automatically sent to my iPhone. We all know the series. Um, I've, I've already illustrated it with ChatGPT. All examples of artificial intelligence, different forms, um, but still, we all have it already in our pocket or we drive in a car who has, which has artificial intelligence. So it is already there. It's really not something new. So then the question becomes, how can we automate and how can we um, use artificial intelligence to mimic what that sonographer does? And on the right, we already see that image where I said, okay, we acquire images, we sort, we sort them, we arrange them, and et cetera, et cetera. And if we translate that to a computer brain or a neural network, on the left, we can see what that looks like which is basically your input that we do view classifiers. So we have a computer 
um, um, recognize views. So plexes as plexes, then sort them and then sort them even better and then sort them even better, just the way uh, you see on the right. And then we input all kinds of filters saying, well, I don't want images of the poorer quality. So you train that computer on what's poor quality and what's better quality and, and, and you teach it how to structureize that. So those kinds of uh, quality filters are in there. Then if you paste another network uh, onto it, which, which can be an annotator, so we train that computer on, on, on literally um, millions of annotations by saying, well, this is a good annotation, this is a good, and, and you show those examples to that computer, it starts to learn how to mimic that. And all that put together can put you into a output, right? Uh, this is very abstract. It's a it's a, um, an illustration, but we want to see that in practice because you know people working in echocardiography they tend to be really practical and visual people. Um, so, what has happened? Um, then the question is is image recognition. So, how well does a computer recognize um, um, echocardiographic images? There has been a, a, a great publication on that in the Lancet Digital Health by, uh, by Trump et al, uh, where he actually took the us two uh, workflow that we saw in the previous slide and tested how well it recognized all the basic views in echocardiography. So not only restricted to 2Ds, but also the velocity traces like, like a CW AOV or PW um, LVOT, tissue doppler left and right. And it was able to accurately uh, recognize those videos with a 91 to 99% accuracy, which is you know, very, very good for a computer that has just been recently trained. Um, of course, there were also annotations that they tested. Um, and, and what the interesting thing about this paper was is you can teach a computer in a certain region with a certain data set to do all these recognition and, and annotational things. But if it works in one place, it doesn't immediately mean that it works in another place. So what has happened to this, this uh, neural network, we, we put it in, um, in different sets. So we put it in the Alberta heart failure uh, set in, uh, in Canada, where it had the same performance. Uh, we did it on a US-based EchoNet dynamic data set for, with over 10,000 echoes. It had the same performance. And then we did it in a wild-type data set in Taiwan uh, with over 31,000 patients, and it had the same performance. So to us, that basically meant that the algorithm that we had built was very generalizable to other geographies, to other data sets, um, which is interesting. So once you have that, that neural network in place, that, that complete workflow, you want to you wanna validate it. Again, not only validate it to, um, to do the view recognition, et cetera, um, but, but in this case, us too wanted it to be FDA validated. And the FDA immediately told us, yeah, well, wait a minute. So, so what does ECHO look like? A general clinical workflow. That means that we have um, a, a human variability, so inter-observer uh, variability. Even worse, we have intra-observer uh, variability. So what we want you to do is send 600 echoes to an imaging core lab, a top-notch core lab, and they will do three human reads of 600 echoes. Um, and, and they will come up with a variability, hopefully a low variability since they have been so well trained and they're in an imaging core lab and it's restricted to a, to a couple of them. So they threw up a really high bar because our automated measurement had to show less variability to each of those three human readers than the human readers had among themselves, which is called the individual bioequivalence coefficient. It's a very fancy statistical word to say that you're interchangeable with human reads. Um, and, and the FDA finally approved this, uh, uh, this algorithm and, and this, uh, this measurement. Uh, so kind of interesting, right? That, that a computer can do everything from recognition and searching for that image, that specific one image that you want and that specific one frame that you want, do a measurement on it, 
and come up with the same number as a human does, or actually the mean of three humans does. Um, so it was deemed non-inferior. Um, and if you have all those measurements, you can actually have a computer do disease detection. So um, a, a, a very nice example is, for example, cardiac amyloidosis, right? We have to do all kinds of measurements, um, but when I see a, an amyloid echo, I immediately get a trigger because I see thick walls. I see a little bit of that sparkly, I don't like the term, but sparkly uh, echoes. I see a little bit of, of right ventricular hypertrophy also with sparkling. So I immediately get a red flag in my head saying, well, listen, this might be amyloid, right? And the computer simply gives me all the measurements immediately and says, well, okay, based on the measurements, I need you to have that red flag of an amyloid. Even better, if we take that a step further, we can actually have a computer train to recognize amyloid or differentiate amyloids from HCMs, from hypertensives, um, um, echoes. So that takes um, the, the automation one step further. Uh, pulmonary hypertension is also another one which is really interesting because in my time i'm sure i i missed a whole lot of pulmonary hypertension patients why because i didn't do all the rv measurements i was simply not always triggered to do uh to do a, a fractional area change or a rv free wall strain or right so so simply not having the time or not being focused enough on a specific disease because the the the, the question of the of the echo was a little bit different. That's all gone because a computer is dumb. I describe a very intelligent computer, but basically it's dumb because it does exactly what it has to do every time. And it does it the same way every time. So what we see here is, is a simple example. Um, drag and drop a file into this application. And I will show you a live demo of this uh, um, um, after my last, last slide, but you simply throw in the DICOM files, it uploads, it takes two to three minutes, you open up, a, open up the exam, and this is where you end up with a full report. So this is not future, this is now. Right? The second step is, can we do something about that image quality? Well, obviously not every patient has the, has the best imaging window, but what you want to do is have the operators function as good as they can get, right? So what we see here is the scan assist of a, of a Cosmos device, which is a handheld scanner. Um, and you see the green and red bars alongside the, um, uh, alongside the sector. And in the best image, it has three, four or five green bars, but as soon as it starts tilting this image, and it will do it right now, it will decrease the red bars or decrease the number of bars and turn red, basically saying, well, this is not a standardized image. So it already is on the market for apical fours, apical twos and plaxis. It has auto capture. So if you have that image of full green, of four full green bars or five full green bars, it will automatically take that clip. So no more, you know, just that minor shift with your scanning hand when you're trying to reach the, 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 the store button. Uh, and this kind of is the first step already to, uh, to make sure that, that the quality, the input quality of data um, is also um, increased. But putting this all together, so scan assist, all those kinds of feature recognition and the full automation, um, then you can see that that we have a workflow that can very well be optimized and, and is also quite nice for educational purposes. And this is basically what a human in, in echocardiography does, right? It is the assisting, it is the recognition and labeling, it is the annotating and the interpreting and getting to a differential diagnosis and all of that. So that has all already been optimized. So that workflow optimization, how does that work? And is there anything um, published? So it is being published. Um, this comes from, from the US2 white paper. 
uh, which was actually quite an interesting um, 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 test that they did. So what they did was take um, um, complete novices and train them for two weeks. So they had to sit next to experts and watch what they did with their hands. And every time after every echo, they had five to 10 minutes to simply hold that probe and try to get those, those images. It was a very condensed um, a protocol that they did. It was, it was restricted to, uh, to diastology and, and the four chamber, two chamber and plaques. Uh, but just to give an idea about the uh, ejection fraction. Um, and, and basically they came up with novices doing um, in approximately 12 minutes that condensed study echo. So that kind of is the first step to already saying, okay, listen, we, maybe sh we, should, we should look at echo in a different way. Obviously you have these real extensive echoes of you know 3d and all the strange things that we do we can't get that to novices but acquiring a simple echo for simple purposes screening purposes this is this is already um, um, taking taking the first steps um, so in in summary ai's potential in echocardiography um, um, lies in a couple of and in a couple of uh, uh, points, which is shorter waiting times for the echocardiography uh, exams and, and, and hopefully earlier uh, diagnosis. Um, we want to have that, that facilitated access of echocardiography to, to go to the primary care and maybe even into homes. Is that a real weird thought? No, because a decade ago, you had to go to the, to, to the hospital to, to get an EKG, and now you have it on your Apple iWatch which can tell you that you possibly have an arrhythmia, right? We see the same thing um, in the future and maybe not even that distant future for, for echocardiography. Um, researchers, this is for also in the research, AI has, has this huge potential because if I can now recognize all the images and do all the annotations, I can do data. I can do large sets of data and do it in a, in a in a very cost efficient uh, matter in, in, in short, uh, short times. Um, anyway, better workflow efficiency, et cetera. That's all the things that we, uh, that we went through. So my end conclusion is the future for ECHO is now. We are starting right now with it. So just to show you that this is, that this stuff doesn't only exist on On my uh, on my slides, this is the the web application that we have, um, and it's a simple search screen. So once you upload a DICOM exam, it takes two to three minutes for it to fully process. And where you end up is a search screen. Uh, you can simply select a patient, and we will put you immediately at the end result of that whole network that we just described. So in this case, we see a report the patient characteristics, immediately have findings, immediately have a little bit of disease detection here um, and all the measurements. Again, I'm making a little bit, um, um, doing this a little bit faster because I want uh, some time for you to ask questions. But what has happened in this case, 124 images came in, everything is recognized. So I didn't touch this data, but it recognized and labeled plexes as plexes. It recognized that this is a focused plex with color. Um, it recognized uh, um, PWMVs, it recognized CWTRVs, tissue doppers, uh, et cetera. It even recognized when, um, uh, when I did a misfire acquisition, right? So in this case, I was, you know, the sonographer was making an echo and started pounding that store image button um, and, and, you know, did it too fast in this case. So this is a non-image, we recognize it as 2D, but it is immediately filtered out. So there's no way a human nor the computer will have to look at that. In addition to that recognition and labeling, it, it will recognize the quality. So what it will do is, is that quality filtering, what I started off with. Looking at these three apical core chambers, this one is obviously of the lower quality out of the three, because we see a little bit of short shadowing artifact, the left atrium isn't fully uh, opened up, um, and the application will put a confidence level on it based on that confidence level, 
for image quality and based on the confidence level for annotation and based on a series of other confidence levels, it will provide you with that best and optimalized uh, measurement that they use. So now, since we have all that data, we can provide this report, right? And what is so, so cool about it is that you hover over it, you can immediately see all the previews of all the measurement sets there. You can see everything. So, you know, it's a black box approach to giving you all the measurements. If you wanna adapt it, simply click it, look at all the other measurements that have been automatically done for you to, you know, sift through and see if you like one better. You can flag it, you can see it, you can do your own measurement if you're as stubborn as me. Uh, you know, I always wanna, wanna get that feeling of that echo simple plus um, uh, at that measurement no searching for labels because you're already in that label so we decrease the number of clicks in echo uh, tremendously but what's maybe you know the list is very extensive of all the measurements that have been automated and go all the way down to um, uh, left atrial strain uh, but what is kind of interesting is that all those measurements are also already interpreted so in this case we came to a mildly abnormal systolic function wacky because the biplane ejection fraction was 47.0%. Uh, we have the normal values all pre-programmed and nested in this report. So no more looking for PDFs on, on the ESC or ASE uh, uh, websites, or you know, I used to have this in, a, in plastics on my, on my desk next to my echo machine every time I have to look for, for those measurements, you know, obviously for, um, um, EF, I, after all those years I knew, but one of the more difficult things was diastolic function, that whole flow diagram of, of several parameters. I need to know the cutoffs and, you know, see how many are present, all programmed. So in this case, we come up with the diastolic dysfunction, grade three, increased LAPs, uh, et cetera. Um, this also goes for a little bit of the disease prediction, what I started off telling. So we have fully aortic stenosis in here with AVA and AVA index. Um, and again, those, uh, those uh, uh, guidelines, we have a little bit of um, regurgitation detection. So this is kind of an interesting thing. The computer already recognizes that there is an MR jet. And if there is an MR jet, it immediately starts outlining them. So it will look at that measurement in here. It will see, hey, I see a jet here. I will delineate it measure the area of it and put that against the left atrial area. Uh, it also does vena contracta. Um, so we're, we're kind of striving forward to getting all these measurements in and, uh, and more and more actually. Um, we have that for MR, we have that for TR, pulmonary hypertension, like I mentioned. And this is kind of an interesting thing. Uh, what, I, what I already mentioned was the clinical considerations. So simply notifying you as a user, if your patient has been referred to you with signs and symptoms of heart failure and the biomarker, in this case, anti-pro-BMP is above the abnormality threshold, according to the guideline, then we have the echocardiographic parameters for you to get the diagnosis of heart failure, in this case, with mid-range ejection function. Uh, you know, simple flags, just so you don't forget. Um, and this one is the amyloid, um, the amyloid detection in this case, the consider amyloid. We have all the echo parameters. They look like the guideline or the guideline actually tells us, well, if these parameters are positive, then you should consider amyloid. Um, so in summary, upload any DICOM study, irrespective of how many images into this application, takes two to three minutes to fully process, end up with a full report, which is then completely opened up to you as a user and you know, to work with it. So you will actually become the overreader of the AI. Um, and and uh, well, that concludes the, the presentation on AI and ECHO um, and the uh, demonstration of such an application in, uh, in real life. You're on mute. Thank you for this presentation, Dr. Hummel, uh, all the way from the Netherlands, for those who are joining a little bit later. And
the other have developed uh, will change the way we, we do things. And uh, whether we could afford it uh, or it's going to make um, our job easier or it's going to take away our jobs. Sorry, again, could you repeat that? Okay, so um, the age old questions of man and machine working together versus mm -hmm. man versus machine. So, um, yeah. so do you think um, uh, with the tools that you developed or your team developed is so elegantly uh, and uh, you've um, validated that uh, through many of the uh, 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 trials and efforts that you have done? Uh, and, and how do you see all this fits in together? Can we afford it? Is this going to make our life easier? Are we going to have a lot more time playing golf or spending okay. with the family, uh, making our image uh, better, or, or, or we're not going to have a job anymore? The machine will do everything. Yeah, good question. So so this application that, that I just showed you um, was never made to replace a human. It will, it will supersize you because it takes away all the manual labor intensive things, which are highly variable in the end and, and automates that with, with less variability and, and, and which actually helps you as a sonographer to focus on what you wanna do, which is the hemodynamic thinking, which is the cardio mechanic, which is spending a couple of more minutes doing that 3D echo or evaluating that valve or getting that extra shot you wanna see of that thrombus, right? So it, it, it actually tells you, and, and, and one of my colleagues is here, Seth, he's a great baseball fan. He tells you, you start off at the second base. And, and you know, so you have an advantage. And it is, it is, you know, it augments you as a sonographer to work better, to work more accurate and to work more efficient. Um, the other thing is that AI is already here. Right. If we ever have the illusion that AI is not here and is not going to happen, you're wrong. So will it replace us? No. Will it, will it, you know, will we have to adapt a little bit to work together with this AI? Yes. And will that make us more efficient and better? And will that solve a lot of problems? Absolutely. Fantastic. Thank you. And uh, any other questions from my colleagues? Uh, I have a question, uh, Jimin, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Perfect. Hi, good morning. My name is Fotos. I'm one of the Echo Fellows. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, you know, for, you know, the AI is, is very good uh, at learning. It's very good at understanding multiple thousands of images, et cetera, et cetera. How, uh, is there any kind of investigations on how it's worked in less than pristine studio quality images? Like, has there been test cases of technically difficult studies or studies that have happened in ICU settings with patients who are ventilated? How does the, how does the software uh, account for those uh, more challenging images? Uh, has it been tested? Yeah, yeah, good question. Uh, but I, I, I tried to address that in my, in my presentation to, with, with showing two apicals that that are not of those pristine qualities, um, but but what the application in this case does it 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 recognizes that that um, um, uh, quality threshold by confidence, right? So if those measurements or if those images drop below a certain confidence level, the application will simply not do measurements. So um, um, if we're talking about the US two application, it will show you only measurements on images that we are certain of, they are accurate, right? So even that threshold for, for uh, image quality and annotation quality has been part of that, of that FDA um, uh, validation. An additional note is there is always the possibility for you as a human to over, overrule that AI. So all the images are still available. You can still do a manual measurement, um, but I think the the broader perspective is that that in a if I classify image quality in three categories, I have the really pristine images where the computer and 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 us will you know more or less do the same. We have those images on which you know we see nothing that gorillas in the mist image, um, and and basically we shouldn't be doing measurements on it, and the computer will not. 
and then we have that intermediate class where you know where we can debate on on do we want to do a measurement yes or no and that's actually the class where variability between humans is the highest and this is where ai and and and, and those this, this application in specific will take away the variability because it will do the same thing every time on that specific on that specific image so is are there thresholds yeah for sure if you can't see a structure the computer can't see a structure either will it be filtered out Yes. Can you still overrule it? Absolutely. Thank you. Was that the question? Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you very much. Any other questions from the audience? Bob? I have a question, Chi Ming. Uh, great talk. Thanks so much. Um, my question is, it's hard. It, it sounds fantastic, right? Um, and I guess my, it's, it's almost sounds too good to be true. So there, there's got to be parts of this that aren't fully developed that need work, what would those be? What, what's your view about sort of how this needs to get better before it's sort of done? If that makes yeah. sense. No, no that, that it makes total sense. So, so the obvious low hanging fruits were always ejection fraction. We're always strain, we're always the, the volumetrics and, and, and those kinds of things. Um, one of the one of the things I I, I just recently encountered was um, contrast echo, for example. We had a whole set of non-contrast echoes that we trained on, but then we got confronted with a with the contrast echo. In Europe, contrast echo is you know not that much of a thing because we don't do it. But in the US, we encountered sites doing seventy to ninety percent of contrast, and we were like, oh oh wait a minute. So contrast is definitely one we have in development. Don't tell anyone it's already in the end stages of development. Uh, so so we, we will have that. Um, one other thing I can think of is, is for example, congenital heart disease, um, which is, is so super complicated, right? Um, one of the rule of thumbs is the smaller the issue we want to train a computer for, the more data hungry that network is. So for example, if I if I want to train it on a very small perimembranous VSD, I need really tens of thousands of proper examples, which are not that easy to get to get by, right? So, uh, you know, there are always caveats. Is the product already clinically useful? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, simple part of the mouth. If I take away all the functional and structural measurements and humans can can rely on them because they are done accurately and i can only you know get every lab to do one echo per machine per day more you can already do the math that that this will increase your the the amount of echoes you can do on a yearly basis so you know the the return on 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 investments is already is already there i think Geraldine has a question dr ong is one of our uh... Uh, cardiology associates partner in our group as well at St. Michael's Hospital. Hello. Uh, my yeah. question, I guess, is a practical one. So how do you Im implant such a device? Is it like a, a plug-in that you put, because all this, all the hospitals, all the clinics have different systems, computer system, IT issues with, I guess, all the privacy, you know, the patient data, um, things like that. So yeah. how, how, how do you implement it? Is it each hospital base has its own kind of a, a, as inside a, like, like a software that springs to the hospital or is it an external thing? But if it's an external thing, how do you deal with the, the privacy issues or, or whatnot? Yeah, great, great question. Um, this, is, this is one of the first questions that, that everybody comes with, right? So we're a tech company. Our first focus was immediately, we need to do things in the cloud. Because, because cloud is cool and we have a lot of processing power there. And it's all true, cloud is cool and it has a lot of processing power, but not every hospital is that cloud friendly. So we actually have on-prem solutions um, and that can, that can you know, be as simple as having a standalone box fully isolated or a standalone box connected to your network to a full integration in your CVIS. 
right? So we have already collaborations with, with a couple of uh, CBIS vendors where we have a full integration and, and you know, I, I'm not that good on the details of that because that's above my, uh, above my pay grade, but it is, I, I, I've seen it as simple as click a, uh, a tab in your, in your EHR and be re redirected to the application or actually look in another application, but have the measurements all fully auto-populated from us to AI. So full seamless integration. I guess the, the software has to have the capacity to connect with Ecopax, CVI, all these different like reporting yeah. platforms, et cetera. Yeah, and 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 you know that in on itself is not that different. We all speak DICOM. We all speak DICOM as R, right? And and so so in every uh, setting we come in, there might be the need for a little bit of mapping, right? Label mapping and, and that kind of thing. But but then these 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 applications can simply speak to each other. The us two application is actually viewed as another machine or as another packs to any system. So the communications are there. The communication lines are all available. It's just a matter of you know connecting the dots and uh, putting it there. Great, thank you. So my my understanding in North America. Um, uh... Uh, us too has been uh, integrated or has the ability to integrate with uh, uh, ISCB with Philips, uh, Xero with Philips, as well as uh, GE Echo Pack as well, and and a few other ones that they are working on. So that's what I was uh, informed about in Canada. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You saw a lot of publications of of collaborations with 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 these people coming or with these companies uh, uh, published. So yeah, sure. And again, this integration, yeah. You know, can can be as simple as a box but also full integration and everything in between so in many ways your your software which is uh, application service on the cloud uh, is uh, is actually vendor neutral um, that's i think what what this is all about so that yeah that's that's, that's also a very a very good point the vendor vendor neutrality so so as long as it's dicom we read it and 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 one thing i always kind of find interesting to to think about is the the core of this application is the is the full automation of measurements and disease detection, right? But but that core that can live anywhere. We have a nice UI for doing measurements, etc. But you know, it's a patch on to that core. Um, I have a great core lab, a full core lab, um, a pipeline in which we can can do multi center trials. But it all revolves about around that automation of measurements and disease prediction. So, you know, everything that is patch on is is nice. But if you keep in the back of your mind that the data can live anywhere, integrated in any sense, then you have the full power of AI in your in your hands in that sense. So, I have, uh, one one technical question. Why have the big brain behind the company? Um, I, I can understand how AI can do uh, the two uh, uh, D measurements. I can understand it. How can measure the uh, areas uh, and even volumes at some point uh, depends on the image. The question that I have is, how do you actually do it with the uh, GLS when you didn't have the raw like string image? Like I understand you could actually do it on the two D image that is acquired, like you know, run of the mill. How do how do you do that? And how accurate <laughs> yeah. is that? We have we have five minutes left, right? Oh, okay. uh, <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm just kidding. No, but 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 that that's kind of an interesting thing. So, um, uh, basically, what strain is is the is the length of that circumference of the ventricle, whether you put it on the endocardial border or on the myocardium, or some say they can identify the epicardium, right? Um, and but then it's only a simple formula. The trick is how do you identify that border? And some of them they use speckle tracking, right? They they say, well, we do speckle tracking. We see speckles, and you know, in a kernel, and we we track that through time. It sounds kind of difficult, um, but you know, um, uh, very fancy to say the least. Uh, but but in the end, it's simply learning or teaching a computer to find that border. And you know, some vendors use their their pixelation data for it. Uh, we didn't use pixelation data because we wanted to be vendor neutral. 
So it's kind of a different approach to 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 doing that border recognition. Um, um, and again, that comes with with amounts of data and with with lots of training. Um, so the approach is slightly different, um, but the but the the outcome is the same. So uh, last EACVI where we were last week, I did a presentation on our uh, on our validation, and that will hopefully be um, uh, published soon on how our strain compared to a strain of of, of other vendors. So we basically, you know compared the automated outcome of strain versus strain in a trial. Um, and, and that showed really good um, a resemblance to each other, high correlations, very good at identifying those strain for heart failures. Um, so again, the, the trick is a little bit different, but the outcome is the same. Thank you. Now, now it makes sense because uh, obviously you wouldn't have the speckled data. So how will you actually be able to do that? Fascinating. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. any other questions? Otherwise, we'll close it out and give back about two or three minutes to the to the audience. Okay, going one, going twice. So thank you, Dr. Hummel, for this wonderful experience. It's, uh, uh, it's really eye-opening. I'm sure we'll be seeing you in many of the different uh, international uh, ECHO meeting. I hope you'll come to our Canadian meeting uh, soon and, you know, to show us uh, uh, the product. I'm sure, you know, some of our colleagues will pick this up as well. So we'll start using it in our country. Well, my pleasure. Always good to be among uh, Echo people. Huh? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you. Okay, have a good day, everyone.